So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hannu Braunschweller from the ECHA screening team coordinating the, the substance screening uh, program called ACROSS. And we are organizing this uh, webinar on how substances are screened and shortlisted for the first time as uh, to support uh, the, re the related uh, letter campaign to the reasons of the shortlisted substances. So, in this uh, uh, webinar, uh, my colleagues uh, will explain you uh, the substance screening process and the approach for shortlisting substances. But before that, in my introduction, I will uh, explain you the practicalities of, of this webinar, uh, how we do the audio broadcast, and, and then uh, we run the question and answer session. After the presentations, I will introduce what we uh, try to aim with this uh, webinar and then some more details about our webinar agenda. We are very pleased to have uh, more than 400 uh, participants registered for the webinar, and, and we see that you are uh, currently online already uh, more than 100 participants uh, today. So it's a very good sign, and, and we hope this webinar will be fruitful in answering to your questions what does the substance screening mean to your specific uh, substance and, and what is the shortlisting about. But before that, indeed, some technical issues. So you have the webinar com connection via the, the, your computer and there's the audio broadcast uh, settings uh, that you will join the event automatically while you connect. Uh, so there you get right away the audio broadcast on. Uh, you have the small control panel where you can set the volume control. And uh, please remind, uh, please remember to, to enable the, the sounds on your computer. So if you normally have them off, just now switch them on to, to uh, listen to our presentations. We also recommend you to, if possible, to use the, the, your headphones or uh, and, and anyway, turn on your computer speakers to be able to, to listen to our audio broadcast. Uh, this uh, web webinar is uh, one-way audio broadcast, so you, we cannot hear whatever you, you try to um, uh, give us feedback orally, so please use the chat function for that, and I will come back soon how to do that. Uh, so uh, so the, the only communication in this webinar is through the, the questions and answer panels. So, here you have a screenshot showing how, how the question and answer panel is working. So uh, on the left upper uh, corner, you can see the, the panelists and presenters listed, uh, but also the, 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 the uh, participants um, are there. Uh, if you wish to send us a question and answer session, a uh, question uh, to the question and answer uh, uh, part of the webinar, you use the uh, drop down list and select uh, all panelists before you send your questions. So you type the question uh, below in the free text field and, and uh, push the send button, and you will await uh, for the answer. So you can start uh, sending the answers right away when you, you got them uh, during the presentations, but preferably uh, we, we would recommend to do it in the, the second hour of the webinar after the presentations are over, because you might get uh, answers in those. So we, <coughs> uh, during the last hour, we, we start answering to your questions uh, through the question and answer functions. And uh, uh, as we can see, the, the number of participants is uh, expected to be very high. And therefore, we might not be able to answer all your questions during the webinar. Uh, we, uh, 
if your answer is uh, company specific or, or this kind of, we, we normally answer them in private, but if, if the issue is more common and frequently answers, we, we can also answer to all participants so all the webinar uh, participants can see the, those answers. Uh, unfortunately, we are not uh, equipped to answer substance-specific questions in this webinar, so we can answer to generic I issues related to sub substance screening and shortlisting, but if you would have after the webinar still uh, a specific question on your substance or individual registration-related issue, please uh, send those to our ECA help desk uh, inquiry. Uh, web form uh, and we will address them after the webinar. Uh, after the webinar we will also publish uh, uh, the webinar uh, uh, recordings, video recordings, the webinar presentations are already available to you at the webinar website, uh, at ECA uh, website and after a short while after the the webinar, we will also compile the frequently answers, uh, asked questions and, and our answers to those and publish also that compilation after the webinar. If you don't find uh, the answer in that compilation, you can, and, and we didn't manage to add, answer your question during the webinar, you can uh, resubmit the question uh, with the same uh, uh, help desk inquiry uh, web form indicated in this slide. So in this uh, webinar we will inform you about the substance screening process, uh, what is it uh, meant uh, to achieve, what are the timelines, uh, how, what are the criteria, how we pick uh, substances on the so-called shortlist and how uh, the registrants of those substances can ob obtain more information about what happens to those uh, screen substances. Uh, we will also explain uh, how we are informing you. Uh, we have started uh, from last summer to, to inform the related registrants about the shortlisting, so uh, we will now in this webinar also clarify in more detail how we are doing that and how you, after, the, after the receiving the letter, how you can influence uh, the manual screening process by updating, it, updating your registration pro, uh, dossier. So here is the webinar agenda. After my introductory presentations, my colleagues Palme Atlason and Crystal Tissier will introduce the, the substance screening uh, uh, approach and uh, after that, uh, Giovanni Bernasconi will go through the shortlisting letter campaign, uh, what is the scope and, and, and the expected outcome of that activity. And these uh, presentations are expected to take about one hour, so until uh, four, uh, two o'clock uh, 8 p.m. Uh, Central European time, and from 2 to 3 o'clock uh, Central European time, you have the, the opportunity to, to send uh, further questions and, and we will answer as much as possible by, by uh, 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, Central European time. But e that is the closing time for this webinar and, and any unanswered questions you, you need to indeed then resubmit to our help desk if you don't find the answers in the webinar materials. That was all of my introduction, so the next speaker is Palmi Atlason, who will start the introduction of the, the common screening approach. Thank you. Your floor is yours, Palmi. Thanks. Thank you, Hanno. Like I said, uh, my name is Paul Mertlesson, and I'm here charged with uh, giving you an introduction on what the common screening approach is all about. Apologies if my voice sounds a bit husky, I have a bit of a cold, but let's hope at least it's a webinar so you have no risk of getting infected. Uh, my uh, topic or presentation will cover the integrated screening, a bit of an introduction, how we select the substances, what happens after the screening, 
uh, a bit on statistics from the past rounds, and then my colleague Christelle will uh, cover what you guys can do to influence the outcome, mainly by uh, updating your dossiers. So what is this common screening approach? Well, the aim is to identify and then prioritize those substances where regulatory action can best increase the protection of human health and the environment. And it boils down to one very simple sentence, substances that matter most. Those are the ones that we want to target at least first. This is uh, an integrated screening where we take all the available data at our hands. So not only the REACH registration dossiers, uh, but also is he in elementary external sources, etc. <clears throat> and we uh, identify substances and then allocate them to the appropriate process, if any, of course, because we have to keep in mind that, of course, uh, regulatory action is not appropriate for all substances. But our processes uh, can be broadly split into two groups. One is where we can generate further information, uh, and that's, for instance, compliance check, where we can ask for standard data uh, when there are standard data gaps in the REACH registration dossiers. Uh, but when uh, the concern cannot be clarified with standard data, we can uh, propose a substance for substance evaluation, where we can ask for further information, further testing, further clarifications. Uh, but when the risk or the concern is clear, we can already uh, guide it towards some regulatory risk management processes. And those are harmonized classification and labeling, uh, identification of a substance of very high concern, uh, which leads to the candidate list, and then eventually to the authorization list, and then of course restriction. Now this Integrated approach allows for uh, not only optimal use of resources, but also avoids the parallel processing of substances. So what I mean with that is that uh, the same substance might be picked up in two different processes and the same concern is trying to be tackled in two different ways. We want to avoid that as much as possible. That's just duplication of work. Uh, but it also should ensure that the most effective regulatory outcome or like re regulatory option is chosen for each substance. We run this screening uh, annually, and it can be broadly split into two phases. Uh, one, uh, the yellow phase on this slide here, is the IT screening that is mainly done by ACCA, where we uh, start up in June uh, to define uh, our screening scenarios. We call them screening scenarios, the algorithms that they use to try to identify the substances. We implement those uh, in the autumn on our database, and then use that to generate the shortlist. <clears throat> the shortlist is usually ready in around about January, and that's where we send the letters to registrants uh, telling them that they are, their substances have been shortlisted. The member states then pick up the shortlist and select from it uh, substances uh, and verify the outcome manually, the outcome of the IT screening, uh, initiate any regulatory action if it's needed, and feed back into uh, the next year's screening process in order to improve the process. But how do we select the substances? Well, the shortlisting is a two-step approach. At first, we identify substances based on hazardous properties or data gaps. Uh, so no data does not mean no concern. But we focus on, on both human health and environmental hazards. But a hazard alone is not enough. Uh, and quite frankly, there's quite a lot of hazardous substances out there, so we need to prioritize them based on uh, exposure. So we try to target the ones with high potential for exposure, both to human health and, in, and the environment. So it's sort of a two-step approach using both hazard and exposure. For the hazard identification, uh, like I said, we, we, we really use all the available data that we have, all the data that we can get our hands on. Primarily, of course, it's the REACH registration dossiers. Those are the richest source of information that we have. But we also use, for instance, the CNL notifications, uh, as well as uh, external regulatory programs. There are other national authorities doing similar things. The Australians, the Canadians, the Americans, they're doing all very similar things. We can use their findings in our systems as well, as well as they are using our findings in their programs. But there are all other lists available as well for other bodies, uh, the SIN list, for instance, the IARC, etc. Uh, 
we also use predictive methods. So we use QSAS, uh, we use uh, read across structural similarity, etc. And this is to search, like I said, for either indications of hazard or the data gaps in the hazard endpoints. And we focus on certain hazard endpoints. We call it the eight super endpoints. Uh, for human health, <clears throat> they boil down to uh, carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, reproductive toxicity, and then sensitization. And for the environment, it's uh, persistence, bioaccumulation, and toxicity, so PBT substances, and of course, the very persistent, very bioaccumulative substances. Uh, endocrine disruption covers both human health and environment, so we look at that from both angles. But those are the targets for, main targets for the hazards in our screening. For the use and exposure, we primarily base that on the reported uses in the REACH registration dossiers. But uh, there's going to be a lot more details later on uh, on this, so I'm not going to go into details on this, uh, except that it's quite important to keep your uses up to date. Now, the screening itself, like I said, has two phases. The IT screening results in about 200 to 300 substances shortlisted every year. Of course, we get new information in every year. We get new, uh, new registrations. We get new updates uh, to the registrations. We refine our scenarios. But uh, we're also moving down a bit on the prioritization uh, chain. Uh, but from that shortlist, member states select the substances for further scrutiny. And that is a manual verification of the outcome, but it is also a more of a holistic evaluation of the substance itself. So they go beyond the IT screening outcome and look at the substance as a whole. And they determine whether uh, further regulatory action is required and also feed back into the screening so that we can improve for next year and next rounds. One very good source of information that I wanted to point out to you is the screening definition document. This is a document where we list all of our uh, hazard criteria and our use criteria that we use uh, for uh, screening and shortlisting. We also list uh, which external sources we use. Uh, a number of you have received letters uh, saying that we have shortlisted your substance based on external lists. You can go into the document and find out which external lists we have used for this round. They're not that many, and it should be relatively simple to find out which, which list uh, caused your substance to be shortlisted. We update this document annually, and we do consult member states, of course. Uh, they have a big input into our screening criteria, but we also con uh, consult industry. Uh, the PPT and ED expert groups that we have at ACA uh, industry participates in those groups, and we use those groups to consult with uh, on our screening priorities, screening criteria. So industry has an input into this document. Uh, chapter 8, that's probably the one of most interest now, it lists the criteria that we used to create this short list this year. So please have a look at this document. I included the link to, to it in our uh, presentation, and it's a very, very good source of information, like I said. <clears throat> Well, what happens next? I've been talking about these processes. Uh, of course, the screening itself is not the end. It's just the beginning. But also, the processes themselves uh, don't work in isolation. So they're all interconnected. They're all interrelated. They're all dependent on each other. So I want to highlight this a bit with a, sort of a typical, well, or an example of a substance as it travels through our processes. It's identified in screening. And in screening, it's revealed that uh, there is a concern, but it needs to be further clarified using more, for more information. This information cannot be gained through compliance check. It's not a standard information. So the member state decides substance evaluation is the next step. There they can ask for more information, more tests. They can clarify the concern. But that's not enough. It's not enough to have the concern clarified. We then need to address the concern and make sure that it is uh, properly handled. And this we can do using risk management option analysis, and that's pretty much does what it says on a tin. Uh, the member states or ACA analyze the option they have for risk management. Uh, it can, for instance, be to identify the substance as a substance of very high concern, which means that it ends up on a candidate list, 
and eventually will move on to the authorization list where you guys will need uh, to apply for authorization to use that substance. Of course, another journey, and a lot shorter, could be this, where a substance is identified and it's decided that no, current, no action is currently needed on this substance. Either it is, uh, does not have uh, hazards or uh, the hazards are properly maintained, so there's no action needed. A more elaborate version of this flowchart is available on our website. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's quite big. Uh, it shows the interaction between all the different processes quite well. It's actually bigger than this. I didn't fit it all on one slide, so I had to chop a bit off the end. Uh, but you guys can go into this uh, flowchart. It's interactive, so you can click around. Uh, the yellow bits uh, provide you with information on the actual processes themselves. So if you want to know what is this process, what does it do, what does it mean, what are the consequences, you can click on that and find more information on the process. If you want to know the substances involved in these processes, click on the blue parts. They are lists of substances, so you can find easily which substances, which type of substances are currently being addressed uh, in these processes. So please have a look at that. It is actually quite uh, interesting and quite informative. Because <clears throat> you can influence the process uh, yourself uh, in many steps. In the work preceding the regulated risk management, uh, for instance, uh, the RMOAs, the, co the substance evaluation, compliance checks, you can influence the process by making sure that the registration is kept up to date, that the evaluating member state has all the information it needs to make the appropriate decisions. But you can also start planning. You can plan your business approach. If a substance is under RMOA and it's quite clear that it's going to be a substance of area concern, and end up on the authorization list, you can already start planning substitution, for instance. When a process is ongoing, you can also interact, and you're actually quite encouraged to do so. Uh, all the processes have public consultations, uh, and it is quite important to get the input from industry into these public consultations. We tend to, uh, where well, we always advertise them on our website, but we also send messages to REITS IT when our substance is uh, under public consultation. So I encourage you to take part in the public consultation, provide the information necessary, uh, provide your opinion on the proposed action. Uh, it's quite difficult to take information into account after the public consultation in the process, so I encourage you to do so at that stage. Because uh, once the outcome is uh, done and dusted, all you can really do is comply, or possibly sue. But let's hope you don't do that too much. But I imagine that most of you are listening because your substance was shortlisted and you got a letter telling you that it was. And what to do then? Well, the shortlist itself isn't published. It's an IT process. Uh, we do a lot of quality control, of course, but it has uh, potential false positives. It actually has definite false positives. Uh, there are always some. Uh, we don't want to cause unwarranted blacklisting. Uh, the outcome itself is also not published. Uh, that's because it's an, it's an early stage, it's early in the process, and it might interfere with the planned regulatory action of the, uh, of the member state. But we do publish the statistics. So if you want to know for each round uh, how many substances went for different processes, how many were screened, etc., we do publish those statistics at the end of the round in the SVC roadmap annual report. And it should be coming out soon for round two. But there is still hope because whenever a regulatory action is started on a sub substance, it is visible in our ACA dissemination site. So what's the dissemination site? It's a one-stop shop for your, all your substance information needs. We have a search box uh, on the ACA front page, uh, quite prominently displayed. Uh, there is an advanced search available, but in the simple search, you can search for the chemicals using EC numbers, using CAS numbers, using substance names. Uh, using synonyms, using nicknames, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, different ways of searching for the chemicals. Uh, the search itself leads to the info cards and the brief profiles. Uh, this is a relatively new thing uh, at ACA. There's been a lot of uh, talk and publicity about this already, so I'm not going to go into too many details on it. It's just a, 
uh, different and a better way of, of uh, showing all the information that DACA has on a particular substance. Uh, and in these info cards, or more accurately below these info cards, uh, it's really easy to see whether the substance is under any regulatory action. We have the PACT there, where we can see uh, substances under RMOA. PACT stands for uh, Public Activities Coordination Tool. This is a catchy title, I know. Uh, the, uh, you can see the RMOAs and substances under further assessment. You can see the COVRA, which is the Community Rolling Action Plan, uh, where you can see uh, substances under substance evaluation, and of course then the Registry of Intentions. And that's where you can see substances under uh, CLH, SVC, and restrictions. And as soon as a member state initiates uh, a regulatory action, it, it pops up there. But where are we now? Uh, a bit on the statistics, because this is our third round now. Uh, we've done rounds one and two, where we looked at 426 substances, and 82% of them were found to require follow-up action. And majority of those that were found to follow, to require follow-up action, were actually uh, found to require further information, either CORAP or compliance check. And the third round now, we shortlisted about 300 substances. We sent letters to some 2,400 registrants. And we expect the member states to select around 200 for further scrutiny. So we always shortlist more uh, substances to allow the member states to pick and choose a bit. Uh, but uh, the rem remaining ones, sadly, are not quite off the hook uh, because we still consider them priority candidates for compliance check. It doesn't mean that they will go for compliance check, but uh, we will check to see whether there are serious data gaps in the dossiers and whether they are good candidates for it. So this is, this is it for me uh, on a bit of an introduction to the screening process. And now Christelle is going to uh, take over with uh, quite a lot more details on how you guys can influence the process. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Palmi, and good afternoon, everyone. So I will, in the presentation, try to uh, uh, exemplify and to explain a bit how you can influence the screening by uh, mainly updating your dossier. You will see that the presentation is quite much focused on information on uses and exposure. Doesn't mean that you should not uh, also update information on the hazard, but uh, we believe that uh, this is where you can really have some impact so that we uh, as authority, don't spend our resources on those substances that uh, do not matter and that also from your side, uh, you spend uh, your resources on the right substances. So to come back again to the common screening, so as already presented by Palmi, uh, the selection of the substances is based on the combination of potential hazard information and use and exposure information. Uh, one thing that was already mentioned by Palmi is that priority is given among all uh, potentially hazardous substances to those having a high tonnage for wide dispersive uses within the scope of substance evaluation, CLH authorization or restriction. But what does that mean and how we do this in the context of screening? So few definition first, uh, because we had to align a bit all those definitions internally, but also and I have put the reference to the Air 12 guidance, where now it has been also clarified what we mean by wide dispersive use. So for us, uh, wide dispersive use is actually a combination of widespread, meaning uh, used at many sites by many users, and uh, for which there is also a potential for release to the environment and or a potential for human exposure. Then I will come more to define uh, what we mean by widespread use. And our understanding is that it's uh, uses by professional consumers and also subsequent service life. But also that it uh, takes into account also uh, use at the industrial sites, unless it can be uh, uh, demonstrated that there is a low tonnage or a very low number of sites, uh, industrial sites. The potential for release, the potential for human exposure also, how we define it. So the potential for release to the environment is the potential for a substance to be released from a use into one of the environmental compartments. 
which means that by definition, a substance that is fully contained will have no or very low potential for release to the environment. A similar uh, definition applies also to the potential for human exposure, where the potential for a substance uh, where the potential for human exposure is the potential for a substance that it's used leads to exposure of humans, meaning workers or consumers. And again, by definition, a substance that is fully contained will have no or very low potential for human exposure. And we thought it was important to have the two aspects in the definition so that it is clear uh, how we would put uh, substances as high priority based on their potential uh, of release or of exposure, but also that substances can be uh, put, of, uh, put as low priority because, for instance, the use or all uses would be fully contained. So, in the end, what does it mean for screening? Uh, it means that the substance potentially hazardous or hazardous with a high tonnage for wide dispersive uses within the scope of substance evaluation, CLH authorization or restriction will be prioritized for further work. But it also means that uh, the same potentially hazardous substance can be parked also for the time being, so meaning being put as low priority in case the substance would have no uses in the scope of substance evaluation, authorization, CLH or restrictions. For instance, if there would be only uh, uses as intermediate, or if the substance uh, would be with no wide dispersive uses. Uh, just to mention that, uh, of course, it's an order of priority, and uh, you will see that in uh, section 8 of the definition document, where um, Palmi mentioned that we have put the priority for this year for some endpoints, uh, for some trigger for concern, we have um, started to prioritize substances uh, on being only widespread, because we have already uh, quite worked on the pool of substance we have uh, during the, the three rounds of screening. Uh, to come back on the scope, uh, those uses, uh, for instance, that uh, would be of no interest. Uh, when I was mentioning the intermediate, of course, here I refer to the authorization, and it's not just those intermediate under strictly controlled condition under Article 17 and 18 but any intermediate use that you can also register uh, in a full uh, registration. Uh, the current Im implementation from an IT perspective, uh, so we have a prioritization for human health related hazard, and there uh, how we have uh, implemented the widespread uses is that if we have at least one professional consumer use or an article service life, then the the substance will be considered as having widespread uses. And for the potential for exposure, uh, we have, uh, for those uses considered as widespread, also identified if they would fulfill a list of uh, certain procs, where we believe it is very difficult to claim that those could be under strictly controlled condition. And you can find the, the full list of the procs in the definition document. For the prioritization for environmental hazard, so far it is only based on uh, the definition of widespread uses because uh, with the current Euclid implementation it's uh, difficult to identify those substances which would have a higher potential uh, for release. Uh, what we have in addition is uh, we are using some external sources of information and we use them to further prioritize or to support the information in the registration dossier. Then, of course, there will be the stage of manual screening verification by member states where uh, additional information can be considered also uh, by member states. So there, uh, clearly, they will look at both the Euclid and the CSR. So here again, more information to better understand the uses. Is, uh, is clearly uh, an added value. Uh, in the current mass screening approach we have put in place, uh, we don't use uh, and we don't have information on new specific tonnage, which means that potentially we can have quite a relatively high number of false positive and negative. And this, uh, I have tried to exemplify it uh, simply uh, below. So if you take two substances with similar overall tonnage, 
for instance, substance A, which would have several intermediate uses, a very high tonnage, and only wide dispersive use and small tonnage going into that uh, one wide dispersive use. Then you have substance B, where you have only one intermediate use, very low tonnage going to uh, this intermediate use, but several wide dispersive uses uh, and an associated uh, tonnage that would be very high. Under the current approach, those two substances will have the same priority because we are not able to differentiate at the level of tonnage uh, which substance is of highest priority. Whereas you can expect that clearly substance B is really the one that uh, authority would like to investigate further and not substance A. So this is to uh, flag to you that uh, even though it's a difficult information to get, this information on tonnage is really important and can have a, a big impact on the way we prioritize substances. Uh, of course, we have uh, worked in improving uh, Euclid, and this will be then t taken into account later on in our screening. And uh, for this, we have developed several new uh, fields to facilitate the screening, so uh, to better identify those uses exempted, such as intermediate or biocide or fuel, because so far it's very difficult for us to exclude substances where many of those uses are, are listed. Uh, to have also a better identification of uses limited to a small number of industrial sites, and which would then not be considered widespread. Uh, but also to have a better identification of uses with or without potential for release and exposure. So we have developed fields where it will be possible to claim strictly controlled condition, again, allowing that the substance is potentially put as a lower priority if most of the uses uh, would be under strictly controlled condition. Uh, on the level of uh, the potential for release to the environment also, uh, we have to think how do we best use information on the total release or release uh, in general. And of course, uh, we have worked in having a better field on how to apply use specific tonnage uh, in the ranking in order to again park substances with high tonnage. Many in the case where most of the uses were not, would not be in the scope of one of the regulatory process but also for those non-wide dispersive uh, uses. So to summarize uh, where you can have an impact if uh, when you look at your dossier, uh, is to report and or update information in your registration dossier on tonnage use and exposure information. But uh, in particular, uh, for substances potentially hazardous to human health, such as CMR, sensitizer, and ED, and where you see that most of the uses are exempted from REACH and CLP processes, and or where you see that, or you know that most of your use take place under strictly controlled condition, and or if you know that most of the use under industrial side take place at a very limited number. Uh, and again, this is in order for both uh, authorities, but also from your side, so that we don't spend time on substances for which there may be some clearly hazardous properties, but from a regulatory perspective, they are definitely not of the highest priority. For the environment, uh, it's uh, quite the same as for uh, the human health, is again to look at, in case you would have most of the use of your use is exempted from rich and CLP processes, and or in case you would know that most of the use takes place under strictly controlled condition. And that's it from my side, and I will then give the floor to uh, Giovanni Bernasconi, who will explain to you uh, all that you need to know on the shortlist and how we have prepared the letter campaign. Thank you, Christelle, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So this is the last presentation of uh, our webinar today and we'll focus on the letter campaign on uh, shortlisted substances. As you have just heard, with uh, round three of common screening, ECA has selected nearly 300 substances for further scrutiny by the member state competent authorities, 
and the affected companies have received a letter from ECA to inform them about the potential examination of their registration dossier. So the aim of this presentation is to clarify the scope and uh, the expected outcome of the letter campaign. So this is the content of my presentation. I will uh, start uh, presenting the overall aim of letter campaign on uh, shortlisted substances. Then, uh, since this is the second year ECA is running such a campaign, I think it's good to have a look back at the results of the 2015 letter campaign and the lessons learned there. And then I will move uh, to the 2016 letter, so the campaign of this year. There I will uh, uh, focus mostly on two aspects. So the reason why the substances were shortlisted and then uh, the timelines for providing a dossier update. Finally, I will conclude with uh, the expected outcome and uh, the next steps. So let's start then uh, with the aim of this uh, letter campaign on uh, shortlisted substances. As you have heard today, we are now in round three of common screening. And with round one, ECA released the 2014 shortlist. Then in round two, together with the shortlist, we decided for the first time to have this letter campaign on the registrants of the shortlisted substances. So in June last year, we sent out letter for substances that were shortlisted in 2015. And now in round three, again, we have just released the shortlist. And again, we have run a new letter campaign with letter sent out this time earlier in January already for the substances shortlisted in 2016. But why is ECA sending uh, this letter to industry? Uh, we have mainly two reasons. Of course, uh, uh, the first is to inform the registrants about shortlisting. So to inform companies that now their substances are under the authority's scrutiny. The second reason is to invite registrants to review the registration dossier and then uh, update them before manual screening by the member states uh, start. So the aim here is indeed to have transparency on the authority's work from a very early phase of the substance selection and provide the registrant the possibility to clarify the suspected uh, hazard profile of their substance and they uh, use. So uh, as I said, let's start uh, with the look back at the campaign of last year, last year and the lessons learned there. So ECA ran this first campaign for round two of common screening for the substances though that were shortlisted in 2015. These letters were sent out last June and uh, the letters we prepared last year were more general, less targeted than uh, the letter we, we just sent you in January. Of course, the overall aim was the same. So to inform you about shortlisting and to invite you to revise and update your registration dossier. Then uh, last year, uh, we were, however, providing only very general information on why your substance was shortlisted and on uses and exposure. And then in the letter, we were also providing general type of recommendation on how to improve your dossier, in particular in the area of the substance identity and uh, read across adaptations. This uh, was uh, done because ECA here wanted to point at the most commonly observed shortcomings in registration dossier based on several years of experience in evaluating this uh, dossier. So what was the feedback we received from industry on last year letter and uh, what was the outcome? Well, several registrants appreciated ECA transparency in this uh, very early phase of the substance selection and the fact that the uh, registrant had the possibility to clarify upfront potential concern with their substance and clarify as well the uses. Uh, at the same time, we have also monitored the update and we have seen a very high number of updates received. So many registrants either submit an update or propose an update plan. So indicate willingness to improve the quality of their registration dossier. However, we also received more critical feedback. Industry last year was uh, pointing out that the letter campaign timeline was, was not optimal because the letter was sent out only in June 
while uh, the member state competent authorities' manual screening was already ongoing. Then uh, they indicate that the letter content was uh, too generic. Uh, for industry, the general recommendation that we provided on substance identity and read across, for example, were not considered very helpful because they were not dossier or substance specific. And then they also indicated that the reasons why the substance was shortlisted, as indicated in the letter, was uh, too vague. There was, uh, ECA also did not indicate an exact deadline for dossier updates in the previous campaign, and this creates somehow uncertainty to industry. And uh, few registrants, uh, few uh, companies also flag uh, a potential unclarity uh, related to the interlinks of these informative letters with any other ongoing process that could exist for their substance. So this was a very important feedback for us. Thank you for that, because we tried on the base of this feedback to improve the content and uh, the outcome of uh, this year campaign. But before moving to the 2016 letters, uh, there is another uh, important information we want to share with you regarding the short list of 2015 and the last year letter campaign. And this is related indeed to the monitoring of uh, dossier updates. As I said, ECA is uh, uh, monitoring very closely all the updates received for the substances shortlisted last year and is sharing with the member states uh, a report with all the updates received on a monthly basis. So this is important because it means that also the updates that were received later during the manual screening or after the manual screening was completed are still valuable in case there are any regulatory action started on the substance. In terms of uh, amount of update received, we had uh, update for approximately 50% of the substances shortlisted within six months from the letter campaign. And uh, in terms of content of this update, most of them were related to uh, more information on uses and tonnage per use. But now let's move to this year campaign. So, as I said, based on the feedback we received from industry from the first letter campaign on shortlisted substances, ECA try really to implement the content of this year's letter and to follow all the suggestions that were provided last year. So, then we had uh, this campaign, as I said, much earlier than in the previous round. Actually, this year we managed to send uh, these 2,400 letters out on uh, the same week uh, that we released uh, the uh, short list to the member states. Then we prepare a letter that is more targeted, it's more focused, and provide more information on why the substance has been shortlisted. And uh, in this letter, we avoid the type of general recommendation that were provided last year, since these were not deemed uh, very useful by the registrants. Then uh, there was the clear message from industry that they would prefer to have a clear deadline for when to submit an update. And for this reason, in uh, this year campaign, ECA has provided two options. The first one is uh, to update your dossier before the manual screening work of the member states starts, and this is by 11th of March, as it is indicated in the letter. And the second option is to submit an update plan by the same date, in case your update requires a longer time. If, for example, you need a discussion within the CIF or you are planning a more complex type of update. Finally, in this year's letter also, ECA tried to clarify the potential interlinks of these informative type of letters with any other process that might be, already, might be open on uh, your substance, for example, a compliance check. So what is the outline of uh, the 2016 letters? Of course, we have company and substance-related information at the beginning, and then already in the second paragraph of the letter, ECA explain the reasons why the substance was shortlisted. So here, as I said, we have a more comprehensive explanation than the one we used uh, last year. However, if you want to know more on uh, shortlisting, on common screening, and if you want to understand more of why your substance was picked, you are reminded to go to the Annex 1, where we have useful links to our common screening approach. Then uh, the letter continues with the timelines uh, for the dossier update, 
and then an invitation to review in particular two aspects of your dossier. First one is uh, related on the uses and tonnage per use, and then uh, the hazardous properties as they are indicated at the beginning of the letter. And finally, the letter is concluding with a clarification of the potential interlinks of these informative letters with any other process. So now the next few slides are uh, related on uh, the two aspects that we consider of more importance for you today. So why the substance were shortlisted and then the timelines for the update. So let's start with uh, reasons why substances were shortlisted. As it was uh, presented before by my colleagues, uh, substances are shortlisted for further scrutiny by the member state competent authorities because of a potential hazard and because of its use profile. Uh, to do that, ECA has developed several scenarios in collaboration with the member state competent authorities to support an automated IT screening. As it was mentioned before, all these uh, scenarios are well described in a definition document that we have just updated because it was the base of this uh, round three of common screening. So a lot of useful information can be found there. And this document, as it, as it was highlighted in the previous presentation, uh, has been prepared also in collaboration and consultation with member states and also in consultation with industry stakeholders. Then uh, in terms of the scenario we used, this scenario are based, of course, on the information available in the Euclid file, but ECA has also made use of external sources, like external list, other regulatory programs, and QSAR prediction. It's also important to, to point out that single scenario are often not used in isolation, but is actually, most of the time, a combination of different scenarios that trigger shortlisting of a substance. So, for example, scenarios that are based on external sources are often combined with other evidence in order to trigger shortlisting of a substance for, for the scrutiny by the member states competent authorities. It was already presented in the previous presentation, but we want to stress again the importance of uh, this uh, definition document that supported round three of common screening. A lot of useful information can be found there. So please consult this document if you have concerns and questions on why your substance was uh, shortlisted. We are confident that this document can provide a lot of answer. It contains a description of the logic behind the different scenario, also on the uh, external sources that ECAS used and general information on common screening. Now, in the next slide, I would like to move to a couple of illustrative examples on the criteria that might have triggered shortlisting of a substance. And I will start with an example of a suspected endocrine disruptor. So we had several scenarios for a suspected endocrine disruptor. One of them required that there is evidence in a registration indicating endocrine disruption effects in ecotoxicological study and that the substance or a constituent is listed as suspected endocrine disruptor in external list. So this uh, uh, line you see at the top of the slides in italic are the same you might have seen in your letter if your substance was hit by this uh, specific ED scenario. As you can see, actually this is a combination of uh, different scenario because it requires two criteria to be met. First one is uh, that the substance uh, shows some potential ED related adverse effects in ecotoxicological study in the dossier. And to identify those, ECA have used a text search functionality. And then a second criteria that need to be met is that uh, the substance or a constituent is listed as suspected endocrine disruptor in an external list. So which list have we used? For this specific scenario, ECA have used the four list of suspected ED and these are the Commission, WHO, TEDx, and SIN list. So to conclude on this example, for ECA, these evidence are considered sufficient to trigger shortlisting, but here we are talking about a shortlisting of a substance as suspected ED that need further verification by the member states competent authority. We consider that the initiating uh, manual screening only require an indication of a potential risk, 
And it's during this uh, manual verification that the member states need to verify the findings, and this could potentially increase our confidence with this type of scenario for a future round. Then a second example is related to suspected sensitizer. In this case, a scenario for suspected sensitizer is based on the fact that the substance is classified as a respiratory sensitizer by at least one rich registrant and does not have an harmonized classification for that hazard class. So again, for ECA, this is considered sufficient to trigger shortlisting of this substance as suspected sensitizer worth manual verification by the member state's competent authority as a potential CLH candidate. So during this manual verification, the member states need to assess if the classification by this registrant is justified and if this classification is due to the property of the registered substance or it is due to the composition of the substance because of, for example, the presence of an impurity or a minor constituent. If the latter is true, so if the, uh, possible, the classification by the registrant is due to the composition, then the member states in the manual screening will also have to assess the composition within the joint submission to identify if the substance needs further regulatory action or the concern is actually in this case uh, applying to one or few of the registrants that have this uh, impurity or minor constituent. In this case, this one or few registrant might fo be followed up separately. Then uh, let's move uh, to dossier updates and their timing. So should you update your dossier and by when? First of all, I think it's uh, important to clarify that these are informative letters. So you have no legal obligation to submit an update. However, we consider that it's in your own interest to update your dossier and to make sure that complete and up-to-date information are available for the member states that will perform the manual screening of your substance. This, in fact, will help the member states to decide if any regulatory action is indeed needed. When we look then into the hazard, please uh, have a look in your dossier, in uh, particular to the potential hazards as they were identified and indicated in the letter you received. In this case, it's important that you ensure that your dossier is compliant with the REACH requirement. So make sure that you do not have uh, data gaps for standard information requirement at your tonnage level. Then it's important that you use uh, robust and valid studies. And if you make use uh, of uh, adaptation of the standard information requirements, for example, by means of read across, weight of evidence, uh, or QSAR prediction, please ensure that these are made accordingly to the requirements of Annex 11 of REACH. So then you have two options here. Either you strengthen your reasoning in the dossier to demonstrate that you have a safe use of the substance and all the risks are covered, or in case you have uh, data gaps for information requirements that are at Annex 9 and 10, you should consider making a testing proposal. Then another important source of information for our priority setting and selection of substances is based on the information on use and tonnage per use, as it was also presented before by Christelle. So here again, please, it's in your own interest to ensure that the information on uses are complete and up to date, because this can facilitate the work of the member states to decide if further action on the substance are needed. In the letter you received, ECA advises you to ensure uh, to review the uses, that, that you review the uses and to make sure that the uses you register are still va are all uh, valid for, uh, for your substance and uh, you do not register uses that no longer exist. Then uh, to provide to the extent possible the tonnage per use. This, as we said, is a very important information for our priority setting. Is not something that ECA is disseminating, but is only used internally. And as Christelle explained, not knowing uh, this information will require ECA to make worst case assumption and to be conservative, considering that possibly all the tonnage go in uses that are widespread or wide dispersive. Then uh, we ask you also to make sure that uh, uses are described using a sufficiently informative use name that you cover the whole life cycle of the substance 
and then uh, that uses are assigned to the appropriate life cycle stage and uh, linked to the relevant exposure scenario. Then as we move to the update, please note that if your substance uh, uh, if you plan to make an update, then the implementation of this uh, one substance, one registration principle uh, is already ongoing in Rich IT and it might affect your dossier update. So what does it mean here? So if you are a lead or a member in an already existing joint submission, you will be able to submit an update. However, uh, note that in the future, ECA will uh, only allow one joint submission per substance. But then if you are an individual registrant, you are not allowed to update your dossier. If there is a joint submission of the same type, then in this case, you need to join the joint submission. And also if you are an individual registrant, you are not allowed to update your dossier. If you change your dossier type, intermediate or full, and then there is another individual registrant with the same type of registration. In that case, again, you need to submit jointly. So already now ECA is implementing this uh, one uh, substance, one registration principle in Rich IT. This means that registration outside uh, joint submission are not allowed. However, for the time being, for updates, we have some flexibility. So if you need more information on uh, this aspect, please consult the later uh, news alert that was published and is reported in the link at the bottom of this slide. Now uh, let's move to what is the expected outcome and which next steps you should pay particular attention to. So as we said, the short list was released 25th of January and the member states have until 11th of March to book substances and then to solve potential double or multiple bookings for the same substance by different member states. Then on 11th of March, the manual screening verification starts. So as we said, it's very important that complete and up-to-date information are provided in your dossier because it can help the member states authority to assess if the concern, as it was identified by our IT screening, is confirmed and then if any regulatory action is indeed needed. So consider updating your dossier by this date or submitting a dossier update plan as we indicated in the letter. This is a reminder, it was presented also before, ECA is not uh, communicating directly to industry the results of the manual screening, but however, company can check the status of the substance at any time via the search for chemical functionality that is available on our home page. So there you can see if uh, any process is intended or has already started for your substance. Then in case you have further questions with our common screening approach or with the letter campaign, we invite you to consult this documentation, the ECA common screening web page that as we said contain uh, many useful links then uh, the new and updated definition document that we used uh, for the short listing uh, created in round three, and then also the links that are reported in the annexes uh, of the letter you have received and are also repeated in the, the last two slides of this presentation. Also, this webinar material is now available and hopefully will help you to clarify any doubts you might still have. And uh, soon ECA will also publish a Q&A document to address uh, the question on common screening and shortlisting. So with this, I would like to conclude. I hope that you find the letter campaign informative and useful since it gives you the opportunity to clarify the potential hazard and the use profile of your substance. Please note that if your substance has been shortlisted, we have evidence that uh, the data in your dossier are not complete or raise a potential concern. Additionally, external sources of information might indicate a concern with your substance, and then likely we have exposure to human and the environment for these substances. So we really encourage you to make sure that up-to-date and complete information are available in your dossier because this can influence the manual screening outcome of the member states and potentially further processes. So please consider making an update or submitting an update plan by 11 of March this year. 
With this, I conclude. Thank you for your attention. I hope this was informative. I now hand it over to Hannu for closing remarks. Good afternoon. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, good afternoon to those who I didn't, uh, at, who were not attending in the beginning of the webinar where I gave the introduction. Uh, so now we have heard all the presentations, uh, the, the, the description of our substance screening process and an introduction to the shortlisting approach and the related letter campaigns. We hope that with these presentations we are able, we have been able to answer to most of your questions, but now you have the next almost one hour time to send your, your further questions via the chat function. So to recap what I explained about this chat functionality in the beginning of the webinar, just uh, look at your WebEx uh, panel and uh, on the the right hand uh, bottom uh, corner, you should see the chat uh, area where you can uh, 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 write your, your questions. So you please uh, choose the option uh, which panelist you would like to send the questions. Uh, uh, choose there the option all panelists that helps us assigning the, the questions. And then you, you can write your, your questions and, and we will assign it to our experts. And so far we are able, what we see coming in questions, we are able to answer to all of them. But indeed, I, I see that we have uh, almost 300 uh, attendees to this webinar. So if you have lots of questions, we might not be able to answer to all of them. So we close the question and answer session at uh, 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, Central European time. And if you haven't received an answer to your question by that time, we ask you to resubmit your question to uh, the, our help desk contact uh, web form. Uh, but before that, uh, as a reminder, what uh, Giovanni just said, please consult first uh, the, our presentations, uh, you might find the answer there. And if not, uh, the, the, the definition document is another key source of information together with our website for the uh, substance screening. And, and the links to those are included in uh, Giovanni's presentations. And uh, as uh, if you are concerned, uh, your question relates to the follow-up actions. Indeed, the, the chemical search uh, functionality on the ECHA webpage uh, is the main, main way to find uh, the status of planned or ongoing regulatory actions for uh, the substance uh, in interest for you. So this is uh, the first time we organized this webinar and it would be also very uh, nice to have your feedback. Uh, so when you are closing the, the webinar, uh, join, uh, you will see, uh, get uh, a feedback form. So please give us your ideas what could be improved and also if you found this useful way of getting information, uh, answers to your questions uh, on the substance screening and, and shortlisting. But indeed, we hope this ha has been fruitful for you to understand the shortlisting approach related to the substance screening program ECAN and the member states is conducting. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, participation and, and we are indeed expecting your further questions in the expert panelist. Thank you and, and have a nice afternoon. We will inform you with a brief uh, chat uh, uh, message uh, when we close the que question and answer session. So I will close this video presentation here. Thank you once more and have a nice afternoon.